Okay, so welcome everybody. Uh, let's start the third session of DLS. So it's my pleasure to present uh, here Kevin Menar from Shopify. He's going to talk about JIT are nice, but why aren't we using them? So, floor is yours. All right. <coughs> All right. Uh, thank you everyone for having me. Uh, flip this around. All right. Um, so, in keeping with the theme of this year's DLS, uh, we're looking at where the next two or three decades of dynamic languages might go. That's a really broad topic to cover in 20 minutes, so I'm going to focus really on just JIT compilers and why we aren't really using them. Uh, so by way of background, I work at Shopify. I'm an engineer there, and I've contributed pretty heavily to the Truffle Ruby implementation of Ruby. Uh, I've worked in industry for a couple decades. Uh, that's not to convince you I am a captain of industry or anything like that. It's just there's an astonishingly high percentage of people working on optimizing runtimes that have never actually written code. Uh, so Shopify, uh, we're, about, uh, we're over 5 million lines of code. We have a fairly modern development process. Uh, we do everything through pull requests that kicks off a CI process. If the repository is connected to a service, uh, upon merge, we'll initiate a deploy through a continuous deployment process. Um, we open pull requests automatically for security things, so a large amount of our CI is actually triggered not by humans. Uh, we make extensive use of Rails. This is a MVC web framework for Ruby. Uh, it came about at a time when web frameworks uh, required a lot of XML configuration and were mostly written in dynamic, uh, sorry, static languages, so they had a compilation and deployment step. Rails puts a premium on developer productivity, uh, so this is a console session. Uh, we can see is if we call find by name and age on this user class, that method does not exist. It's making use of Ruby's metaprogramming facilities, and Rails registers a message missing hook, which it then takes to break apart the method and dynamically construct an SQL query. Uh, so this makes it really efficient to work with data. Uh, likewise, in Ruby, you can modify the core classes, you can redefine methods and things like that. So Rails makes use of that to add these helpers on core classes that make text generation easier, uh, which is useful for API responses, email generation, uh, and web pages. So uh, performance matters, but so do other things. So we make use of Rails knowing in advance that it is not the most efficient way to do things because it allows us to focus on building applications easier. So when we make technology choices, peak performance matters, but consistent peak performance is even better. Uh, we look at performance at different percentiles, and if there's a huge amount of variance in there, it makes it very difficult to do capacity planning or know when something isn't working. We care about test performance, we care about developer productivity, we need to be able to hire and retain people. They need to enjoy the stuff they're working on. Uh, security is a concern. Maintainability, uh, our ability to measure and diagnose issues at production, uh, and code compatibility. So when we talk about performance and why it matters in industry, it really boils down to three things. One, it makes the application faster. That's pretty straightforward. Um, if we have higher peak performance. As a, a web-based software company, it means generally our response times go down. It makes for a better user experience, makes people happy. Uh, cynically, it makes revenue go up. Uh, but we can also reduce our operational expenses. We do cloud-based deployments, so we gotta pay for whatever we allocate. If we can run on smaller machines or run with fewer machines, then that's a realized cost savings. And finally, we wanna save developer time. So uh, we hire really talented engineers to work on building out the Shopify application and the, the backend services and such. We don't want those developers trying to work around performance limitations of the VM. Uh, likely they don't have uh, a firm enough understanding of the internals of the VM to really know what the problem is. And whatever solution they come up to work around it uh, probably is gonna be difficult to maintain but also we're finding is difficult to JIT compile. So we're trading off a short-term performance gain for something that actually hampers performance longer term. On the topic of performance, though, I just really want to emphasize that peak performance isn't everything. I think this is a topic that perhaps gets lost uh, on a lot of academics where 
test time is viewed as this thing where, well, it's not exposed to the end user, so they don't care. But again, developer time is a huge, if not the largest expense for a lot of software-based companies. I think you'd be amazed to know how much time and effort and money has gone into optimizing test suites at big companies. Uh, and that spills into continuous integration, too. I know uh, there's this belief that because it's asynchronous, who cares how long CI takes? Uh, first of all, I don't think it's actually asynchronous all the time. If it's fast enough, no one's going to um, switch context and begin on something else, just come back a few minutes later. So uh, we may have developers waiting around for it. Uh, we want consistent test time as well. If it takes three minutes most of the time, but 17 minutes 20% of the time, uh, that's difficult for the, the developer to work with. But even then, if you cut all that out, because we do continuous deployment, a slow CI means it takes longer for us to deploy bug fixes. Uh, and just from a simple resource allocation perspective, we have a fixed amount of capacity in our CI environment. If the queue gets too large, we need to expand it, so it's going to cost more. Uh, so when we're talking about performance, for us, we're running Rails. So this is going to be a really deep web stack. It's quite comprehensive. It's way more involved than what you'll see in typical micro benchmarks. For that reason, like a 1% to 9% performance improvement is actually quite meaningful for us. At the scale we operate at, those kind of uh, small gains actually accumulate, and we're willing to invest in something like that. At the 10 to like 100%, uh, that's fantastic. And uh, we're building a team to do that right now. So Shopify invests in YJIT, which is a, a JIT compiler based on uh, Maxime's research in lazy basic block versioning. Uh, that's built into the reference implementation of Ruby now. And at the 100% up, this is where I think a lot of the various talks and peak, peak performance really want to get. Uh, that is remarkably compelling, but uh, in all these cases, uh, there are the attendant disadvantages of slower warm-up and slower test time. Uh, so I'm actually working on a project to integrate Truffle Ruby into Shopify. And um, it doesn't help if Truffle Ruby gets faster, basically. So uh, it's already a huge performance advantage in cases that we've seen over the status quo. So continuing to make peak performance faster isn't actually going to materially change our ability to adopt it. It would be better if more time were spent on addressing things like warm-up and memory consumption. Uh, so I work in a group called Ruby and Rails Infrastructure Team. Uh, this is a small support team at Shopify. We're tasked with ensuring the long-term longevity of our core uh, technologies, principally Ruby and Rails. Uh, a lot of that is around CRuby, the reference implementation, although we try to be good stewards and uh, make sure that our stuff also works well for alternative Ruby implementations. Uh, but interestingly, Shopify is investing in two different optimizing Ruby runtimes at the moment. Uh, so there's YJIT, uh, which is the JIT I just talked about, and Truffle Ruby, uh, which is a complete new re-implementation of Ruby based on the Graal VM platform. So it's going to use the Truffle framework for self-optimizing AST interpreters and use this partial evaluation to generate its peak performance. Um, sometimes we get asked, why are we doing both? And that's the fun part about Shopify. Uh, we care about the long-term health of Ruby, so it makes sense to invest in both of these. It's quite likely that there'll be a place for both. It's rare that one JIT fits all sizes. Um, and we're just operating at different time scales here, too. Uh, so I've kind of just talked about Ruby and Shopify. I have some operational experience with other dynamic languages, and the experience is quite similar there. I also have colleagues at other tech companies. And I think everything I'm talking about here is pretty widely applicable. Uh, so I won't get into all that for time constraints. Uh, so when I was working on this talk, I found the question of where dynamic languages will be in two to three decades kind of intriguing, and then worked backwards and said, well, what if we asked ourselves that two or three decades ago? Would the current crop of dynamic languages be what we came up with? And uh, kind of surprisingly, the like preeminent um, dynamic languages of the day right now really did get started 25 or 30 years ago. And I'm not sure anyone really thought that is where we would be. Uh, part of it is these languages got to start at a particularly interesting time. In the 90s, 
I don't think anyone really liked the programming languages they were using. They, they weren't terribly ergonomic, and that left a lot of opportunity for experimentation with different syntax and semantics. And so we ended up with Python and Ruby and PHP. But on top of that, uh, the static languages weren't really that good either. They were really rough around the edges. Um, a lot of them actually required commercial licenses. So if you were a new student at the time, and there were a lot more getting into the field, you could download Python for free, and you didn't have to deal with an awkward type system. You didn't have to deal with memory management. And you didn't have to pay a license fee to Borland. So that really allowed dynamic languages to thrive. Uh, and even then, we knew interpretation was slower than AOT, although the AOT compilers didn't have super sophisticated optimizations at the time. But we were also benefiting from rapid advancements in CPUs that helped kind of paper over the interpreter performance. So if we look at Ruby, for the first 16 years of its life, it shipped as an AST interpreter. Uh, I had to deploy this in production. It was not fast, it was not memory efficient, but uh, Rails marked such a huge improvement over the status quo that it was worth going with. Um, it took almost 25 years for Ruby to get a workable JIT compiler for it. And all this seems remarkable to me. I think it'd be really challenging to get a new language off the ground and expect any production deployment with only an AST interpreter. Um, all right, so kind of cutting back. We're not in the 90s anymore. Uh, the, the environment's different. And a lot of that has to do with cloud computing. So you used to be able to buy or lease hardware, and you knew exactly what you were getting. You could even over-provision if you wanted. But nowadays, uh, at Shopify and a lot of companies, we work with cloud computing. Uh, cloud computing has been great for startups. It allows you to get going without a huge upfront investment, but we've given up something in return. For the most part, you're running on a hypervisor, so you may have some performance disadvantages there. But you're working with these abstract machine definitions, so you don't know what the clock speed is, you don't know what the, the processor family is. And if you're kind of budget-minded, you're probably working on oversubscribed hardware. So you have to deal with things like CPU steel, and uh, leaking data through speculative optimizations. Moreover, RAM has gotten expensive. And this seems kind of weird, because we can buy tons and tons of RAM for fairly cheap now. But a cloud provider can't really oversubscribe RAM. The only way to do that is with a really efficient balloon driver, and we just don't have it. So you'd have to page out, and that's not great. So in practice, what that means is if you need an extra gigabyte of RAM, you probably need to double your machine size and double your costs, so there's a huge impetus to try to keep your RAM consumption down. Uh, so cloud providers really optimize for small machines and going wide. And we even see that with CPUs now, where they're not really increasing CPU clock speed, they're adding cores. And our current batch of interpreters aren't really well suited for this. Um, having a global interpreter lock, I think, is a liability in 2023. Uh, there's also functions as a service. Uh, this really favors static languages, and I think dynamic languages need to find a way to address distribution uh, to make it easier for you to shift that workload to another server. So for new languages and the current ones, I think we need to start to adapt to the new compute environment. With our current batch of languages, it seems unlikely we're going to just up and drop them, but if you're working on a new language, um, you do need to take this into account. And unfortunately, I, I really think it would be challenging for a new language to gain traction. Uh, I, I don't really have a good mind for new syntax and semantics, but from a practical point of view, if a new language wants to be adopted, it needs to have some selling point. And the current batch of dynamic languages have a huge amount of libraries and the ecosystem built up for them, but those languages have also evolved over uh, the last three decades. So they haven't been s sitting targets. On top of that, static languages have learned from dynamic languages and now have more developer productive features. They ship with package managers and test libraries, and uh, they've replaced the verbose type systems with type inference. They have better tooling, and so on. And as I mentioned, we have a much higher requirement for performance these days. Uh, so if Ruby were to come out today, I don't think it would be a success relying with its slow AST interpreter. Uh, on top of that, we now need to be able to monitor things and we need to be able to debug them. So these are baseline requirements for building a new language. 
Uh, and we're seeing Python excel by being able to integrate with external libraries. I think that's going to be something we need to consider and have as a first class feature in any new language. All right, but coming back to the mature languages, we've known about JIT since the 60s, and we have all these really popular dynamic languages, and outside of JavaScript, like none of them have JITs used in wide-scale deployments. So why is that? If we look at Ruby again, Ruby has actually had a lot of research poured into it. Uh, even now, there are several active implementations of the language, some pushing on different avenues of JIT compilation, others on AOT, uh, and there's a whole kind of graveyard of projects that were started and no longer to live on. Um, and some of these predate Ruby's, C Ruby's own adoption of a bytecode interpreter. Uh, out of this list, only JRuby has had any amount of success, I think, and even then it's basically a rounding error. I think most people use it more for its Java interop than its ability to optimize Ruby. So what happened? It comes back to these factors and technology choices. It's not just about peak performance. But moreover, for a language like Ruby or Python, it's really difficult because there isn't a language specification. So uh, compatibility really becomes whatever the reference implementation does, whether that's intended or not. And developers will build around that. Uh, on top of that, because these languages didn't have excellent performance, uh, there was a huge corpus of native extensions that came about. And uh, kind of getting to the point I had about more efficient up and down calls, these languages don't really have a native extension API. What they do is they expose all their internals and then people use that. Uh, that's created some challenges for the languages to evolve, but it really makes it difficult for a new implementation to come along because they need to treat these internals as if they were a stable API. Uh, Truffle Ruby can do this, but it pays a performance overhead in doing so. And then crucially, warm up and test time have been problematic with all of these alternatives. Uh, it's really hard to compete with a hand-tuned bytecode interpreter. Uh, tooling's also a problem. So in the JVM, we have a standard tooling interface. We don't have that in Ruby or Python. So if you want a profiler, those end up becoming implementation specific as well. Uh, but we have had JIT successes. Um, so broadly, I think that comes down to two categories. We have those that optimize for the VM at the bytecode level. Hotspot pushed on this really hard in the 90s and is probably the state of the art. And then on the languages side, uh, there's no shortage of JIT compilers for JavaScript. Lua's done well with Lua JIT, and Ruby now has YJIT. Uh, so these implement the semantics of the language directly, allows them to generate really efficient machine code uh, and we know that they work. Uh, both Hotspot and the JavaScript JITs support a huge amount of the world economy. But if we dig into the JavaScript JITs, uh, well, first of all, we see there's a lot of them. So basically every browser vendor has their own. That's kind of be expected. There probably wasn't a ton of collaboration. But several of the vendors have multiple implementations. And that gets a little concerning to me because JavaScript just isn't that complicated of a language. <laughs> um, so, this gets to a point, I think, about language-specific JIT compilers. While they can generate really efficient machine code, they're incredibly expensive to build. Um, all of the major ones, except maybe LuaJIT, have had corporate sponsors. They came out of a time when companies owned languages. JavaScript's a little bit different because companies own browsers, but uh, there's a big mismatch, I think, between that world and the current one where we expect languages to be developed in the open. And when someone doesn't own it, it's really difficult to expect a group of enthusiasts to try to match what Hotspot can do. Uh, Ruby's got an interesting situation where it was developed in the open and there is now a company investing in a JIT compiler, but it took 25 years to get there. Uh, these language-specific JITs seem really difficult to maintain. I've never actually built one, but the fact that we seem to get to a point where they need to be rewritten suggests to me that the choice of your IR or what semantics you're going to optimize uh, may make adapting to growths in the language difficult. And I find that the JITs really work best when they're developed in tandem with the language. Uh, so LuaJIT ended up in a situation where it made some assumptions about the representation of objects, and then Lua Core evolved away, and now there are compatibility problems. 
So if JIT compilers are how we plan on really unlocking the performance that people are looking for, how do we streamline their development? Because this doesn't really seem scalable to me. Uh, so there's two options I see. One is we can do bytecode generation. So, uh, like JRuby will do this. It generates JVM bytecode. Now it uses Invoke Dynamic. And it even layers in its own Ruby IR so it can do language level optimizations before it generates the bytecode. And this works pretty well. You get to benefit from all the work going on in Hotspot or Beam or what have you. But the bytecode that you're targeting almost certainly will not support all the language semantics you want. So then you have trouble optimizing those. Uh, you might not even be working in an area that's supported, so uh, there's no guarantees about that bytecode being stable, perhaps. Uh, but more critically, this is a major dependency you're taking on. So for something like JRuby, you need to run on the JVM. You might be able to use GraalVM native image to ahead of time compile that away, but that option doesn't exist for all VMs. So the other approach is meta compilation, and this is kind of similar. Now we're going to delegate the construction of the JIT compiler to another tool. And uh, I happen to really like this approach. I find it really rare for someone to be an expert in language design and in VM design and in compiler architecture. So with meta compilation, you can focus on the semantics of the language, implement them once, and then let someone else that might be more familiar with uh, the low-level ISAs and whatnot to generate efficient code for you. So uh, the, the two main projects I see for meta compilation are Truffle and R Python. Uh, these both make it really easy to build interpreters. Uh, so it's really nice if you want to experiment with things. You don't have to deal with uh, low-level C or C++. You get higher-level abstractions. You don't have to develop your own custom byte code. Uh, they'll also give you some additional functionality for free. Truffle gives you a regular expression and a string subsystem, so you don't have to do that. Um, Truffle will also generate a debugger and profiler and heap dump for you, so you get all that stuff for free. But most importantly, you get the JIT for free. So it's a way faster way to develop languages. All right. So now we're just kind of going another level. If meta compilation is so nice, why aren't we using that? Uh, so Truffle and R Python, like I said, I think are the, the two big ones in this space. They're just not fit for existing language implementations. You can't bolt them onto the current interpreters, even if the underlying mechanisms of partial evaluation and meta tracing theoretically could. So what you're left with doing is re-implementing the language. And that turns out to be incredibly expensive, um, just as building a language-specific JIT is. On top of that, you may run into issues where Truffle or R Python can't optimize um, particular language features the way you could if you were to handwrite it. Uh, but most importantly, warm-up time and memory suffer with these two frameworks. So if meta compilation wants to succeed, I think we need to take in the realistic concerns of deployed software um, more seriously. So in particular, we need to handle those non-peak performance concerns. We need to be able to run tests in a time efficient manner. We need to be able to run on cheaper VMs and things like that. Uh, what this comes down to is, I think there's a lack of fine grain controlled over the code it generates. I would love to have a system where I could sacrifice peak performance by slowing down the warm up cycle or reducing the total amount of memory. And the only solution I've really seen put forth there thus far has been tiered compilation and that just hasn't really been enough. Uh, so where will we be in two or three decades? I think the future of dynamic language is actually still pretty bright. Um, so the current crop of languages, I don't think are going to go anywhere. Uh, Ruby, Python, well, Python's more popular than it's ever been. PHP, these languages power a huge amount of the economy. Uh, so whether they become legacy code or if they're going to keep thriving, I don't really know. I know at Shopify we're investing in Ruby, so we're hoping it'll be thriving. I see dynamic languages also needing to converge a little bit with static languages. Gradual type systems have helped the problems with maintaining large dynamic code bases. Um, I'd love to see more low-level access things so uh, you don't have to sacrifice so much performance by using a dynamic language. But I'm more to the point, I don't see interpretation being suitable in the future. So if you're working on a new language, I think you need to take um, 
performance more seriously as a baseline feature. If you're building a new language, I absolutely would start with either R, Python, or Truffle. You get a huge amount of value right out of the box. If you find that these approaches don't work very well, like you could gradually replace them with something more hand-rolled, but um, I think they're a great way to get started. And they allow you to get feedback as you're developing your language. So you don't end up in a situation where some cool feature you add just can't be optimized well. Uh, our dynamic languages went through something of a midlife crisis over the last, I don't know, five years or so. Uh, we saw a lot of large tech companies trying to solve the same maintenance problems. Principally, how do we get new engineers working effectively in these large code bases without types, and how do we scale them? Um, so we got gradual type systems out of it. There's renewed investment in JIT compilation and other optimizations. Some kind of gave up and they developed languages like Go and started replacing services. But I think dynamic languages are actually in a really good place now. And I think this competition has forced dynamic languages to really up their game. Uh, so for the future of JITs, it really comes down to whether these language specific approaches or meta compilation are the way forward. There's an open question, I think, of, are these maintenance burdens of language-specific JITs or the warm-up time of meta-compilation just inherent to those two approaches, or are they engineering challenges that we can solve? And if we want to solve them, then we actually need to invest in doing that. So I kind of see it as a race. Will language-specific JITs find a way to um, become easier to maintain and build quicker than we can solve the startup and the memory consumption problem at a compilation. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Kevin, for the talk. So we have a couple of minutes for questions. Uh, questions in the audience? Anyone? OK, I have one while we warm up. So you mentioned this meta compilation part. Uh, are you thinking about being more specific, for example, like, thinking myself something like gradual snippets, something like that, so you can gradually low constructs, high level constructs in something more specific to get performance. So it looks like a compromise between high level workload or high level expression or constructs and performance that you can get. Uh, sorry. Uh, well, what I was suggesting is, particularly for new languages, you don't sacrifice much by adopting one of these frameworks. It'd be like using a parser generator to get going and then realizing later that you actually want to hand roll something. So then you could gradually start replacing parts if you found you really wanted a customized bytecode interpreter. Um, but I'm hoping that Truffle and our Python continue to advance such that you find you don't actually need to do that conversion. OK, thanks. More questions? Ah, we have one back. Yes, you mentioned LLVM, for example, in, in passing. Does the existence of uh, things in uh, the machine or architecture independent uh, JIT compilation space, I think, you know, like if you could do a, a JIT version of LLVM or uh, WASM is, is another example of something that's down close to the machine, but you're not having to deal with the details of exactly what instruction set do you have. Um, does that help address any of these problems effectively, or uh, is it still too big a gap? Yeah, so uh, part of this is I think the techniques are sound, but the actual embodiments have been problematic. Uh, every project I know that's targeted LLVM has ended up coming to regret that because the, it's just not a stable IR. So if you want to support a new version of LLVM, then you've got to start going back. And So there was a, a project in... Ruby called Rubinius that did that, and they basically had to rebuild the whole JIT. Um, so I'm a bigger fan of things that will just generate the compiler for me. Um, like, I'm decent with x86-64 assembly. I'm terrible at RISC or ARM. So if I can get something to actually generate that for me, that's a huge win. Um, but yeah, the, the two big ones at the moment have problems. I think they've been very good at proving that both partial evaluation and meta tracing are valid approaches to optimization. So if those two frameworks aren't the way forward, then I'd love to see what the next thing is. <laughs>
Okay, ties up. Thank, uh, thanks, the speaker, again.